Well, my name is Laila Mehta and I'm the water and sanitation convener in the STEP Center. I'm a sociologist and I've been working on the sort of politics and the cultural politics of water and sanitation for about 15 or 20 years. So I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today um, about how we've applied the pathways approach to looking at water and sanitation issues, both in terms of analyzing some of the global debates, but also in terms of a case study. And here I'll draw on a step center project in the first phase, which was on peri-urban sustainability, which had a major focus on uh, questions of access to water in peri-urban areas. So I know some of you are water and sanitation people, so this won't be very new to you, some of this, but um, anybody who's been familiar with the water and sanitation debate know that um, water and sanitation are very key for human flourishing, human well-being, health and livelihoods. It's very, very crucial. It's very critical for human development. But the global situation is really wanting, and this is despite uh, decades and decades of work and concerted global action. So in some ways, um, since the 70s and before, there's been a series of global conferences and activities um, around the water question, the UN Water Conference in 1977, the water decade of the 80s, which sought to create universal access. So universal access has always been a name, but in some ways, things have always been off track and targets really haven't been achieved. Um, and even though the Water Millennium Development Goal was reached two years ahead of its time, um, it's, you still have about uh, 800 million people without access to water globally. And in terms of sanitation, we're talking about 2.5 billion people without access to improved sanitation, of which about a million people still def defecate out in the open, of which half of them are in India. So you're really talking about a, a global issue with knock-on effects on health, on livelihoods, on food security. But of course, as, I've, as, as we did here in a bulletin, uh, where we tried to look at some of these global politics, um, this, there's been no want of effort, there's been targets, there's been meetings. Um, every three years, there's a World Water Forum. Every year, there's meetings in Stockholm. So I mean, there's always, um, and the dominant, so we really tried to look at some of the dominant pathways and narratives and key actors in this bulletin that we did, which was a step center conference on liquid dynamics. And we were interested in some of the dominant uh, framings or narratives around water. So it would be the global water crisis or issues around global water scarcity. Um, and a lot of these narratives are very much at the global level, but when they often fall short when you take them to the local level because it's very difficult to, for example, talk about a global water crisis when water is in fact a very local issue or it's a regional issue. Um, and similarly, you can't really talk about scarcity in aggreg aggregate terms or in volumetric terms. Instead, um, it makes much more sense to talk about the politics of access, contestations around who has access to water and why. And so we tried to look at some of the um, fault lines in water and sanitation. And we found that a lot of the policy debates and assessments uh, were very up there and very disconnected from the everyday realities of marginalized and poor women and men. Now, one example is the sort of way in which the global water crisis is uh, represented very much in aggregate terms. You see a global map with hotspots of uh, water scarce or water stressed areas, but these hotspots or these global maps tell us very little of how different people, men and women, are doing in different areas. They talk little about regional differences or intra-country differences or indeed, you know, intra-city differences or questions of exclusion. Um, a lot of these debates also seem to assume a sort of linearity and equilibrium instead of building on uh, diversity on complexity, some of the issues that Ian spoke about in the previous session. Um, water is a resource that is very multifaceted. It has symbolic meaning, it's culturally very important, it has spiritual meaning. But in a lot of the global discourse, um, the dominant narrative initially was a very engineering focused paradigm, which was very supply driven, and that moved away from the 90s onwards to a very economistic kind of discourse where suddenly it, water was portrayed as an economic good through global consensus. And there's still a lot of controversies around this. So in some ways, the engineering and economics paradigms have dominated, at least in global discourse, over and above the cultural, the sociological, and the political ones. 
And so in that sense, it's not a, very, a debate that is very reflexive, um, and there's a neglect of multiple meanings and culture. And these debates are still raging. You know, any of you who know about water privatization debates or questions of, um, you know, is water a human right or is it an a, a economic good or is it both? Usually it's everything. Water is everything. But the question is which narratives, which debates dominate over others and why and who is making these claims? And finally, there is also um, a neglect of interlinkages and interconnectedness. And in the STEP Center, we have actually had these different domains. And this idea has been to work cross domains. So really, uh, within water, it's really important not just to talk about water, but water and sanitation. And usually, these are very silo-driven discourses. Um, you can't just talk about access if you don't look at questions of waste or questions of quality. Um, and currently, I'm, um, the bane of my life has been finalizing a global UN report on water for food security. And we've really made an effect, um, attempt there to bring together water and food debates, uh, to try and link, link up, for example, questions of the human right to water and the human right to food. Um, it's interesting because I think me and my team, we were appointed to be part of the project team because of our work, because they wanted a very um, social justice, maybe a political perspective, but every version we've done has been watered down. And the final version, which I haven't seen, which is being, going to be launched in Rome on Friday, um, I think is going to be a bit of a dog's breakfast, frankly, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, because I think it's been watered down so much. Um, a lot of the political elements have been, it's really become very, very sanitized. Um, and even trying to push some of these linkages and really going beyond some of these aggregate things that I spoke about, initially was welcomed, but it's just been watered down and it's got more and more politicized. So this is a sort of insider attempt to really change things, but I'm not sure whether much change has actually happened. Um, but, you know, it's an ongoing process. So um, who is actually shaping this debate? Um, Largely, there are a few dominant players that are shaping debates around water and sanitation globally. There is a World Water, uh, uh, World Water Council, that, which is a supranational NGO, actually, based in France, that actually has huge convening power. Uh, it almost behaves like the UN when it actually isn't. It's very linked to um, big water companies, and there's lots of debates between them and activists, for example. There's the World Bank, there's the Global Water Partnership, there's a CGR system. So there are not that many global players actually out there, but they really have massive convening power. And added to this now is the growing power of corporations, such as Nestle, such as Coca-Cola, that are also taking deep interest in global water issues. Uh, really trying to frame water security as a major global risk around which action needs to be taken. I've already mentioned the fact that we're talking very often of pretty universalized discourses, uh, which are often quite technocentric, which draw on aggregate numbers. Um, so for example, the WHO definition of water quality is used as a standard across the board. But of course, villagers sitting in Kenya, in Mexico, elsewhere, will have their own understandings of what works for them or not in their villages. Um, what is defined as improved or safe water supply or safe sanitation source is also quite controversial because um, you have some sources that are excluded because they don't fit the criteria. These universal criteria may be quite difficult to actually implement. Um, I already spoke about the sectoral biases. In most of your countries, you probably know that the agriculture department will rarely speak to the um, water services department or ministry. The food and water people are not necessarily going to speak together, the energy and the water people. But in some ways, they're all deeply connected. But these uh, sectoral biases really persist. And that really prevents this kind of so-called nexus um, discourse that is being driven also pretty much from the top. Um, and when the local community is evoked, often there are lots of biases about the local community. It's portrayed in a, in a quite a, a romantic way, in a homogenous way. Um, and this is also a discourse that is quite gender blind traditionally. Um, you don't really have very good data, sex disaggregated data, for example, on what women and men do in food production and water production, um, especially in the informal realm. Um, and so there are quite strong gender biases um, 
um, around water and sanitation. And when women are evoked, they're often evoked as keepers of the water or um, people who keep the household clean, keep the toilets clean, and this often adds to their uh, voluntary work and existing domestic burdens, as opposed to really seeing them as, let's say, water managers, as irrigators, etc. And so early on in the Step Center, we came up with uh, this term called liquid dynamics, where we really wanted to bring together the social, the technological, and the environmental aspects um, of water and sanitation. Because as I said, there's often been a very siloed way of looking at these issues in this sector. Um, and the idea was to bring them together. So in terms of social, we were interested in looking at how our water and sanitation debates are uh, framed and shaped by wider social developments, questions of modernization, of prestige, for example, will uh, determine whether you want to use a toilet or not, for example. Um, obviously, there are very powerful discourses around these issues that shape um, questions of access and use. And finally, issues around uh, social and power and gender relations. They really determine um, water and sanitation outcomes on the ground. Because even if you have a good policy, or if you're putting in a standpipe or a well or a toilet, ultimately, uh, what actually happens, who will use it, will, de will be determined by these uh, social, ge social gender and power relations. Obviously, technology matters. Uh, the technological element is very, very critical in debates around water and sanitation. It's not just technology as a solution or a fix. And obviously, um, whatever technological solution or fix you're going to use is also going to be molded by its social context, but also wider technological change that leads to innovation, etc. And finally, the environmental <coughs> dimension. Um, this dimension is often neglected. It does not, doesn't only concern questions of hydrology, you know, uh, river flows, et cetera, which determine what the outcome is for a dam or a, or a different water system, but indeed also um, the environmental impacts of certain interventions, for example, such as sanitation, such as toilets, what happens to the waste, for example, questions of the interaction between wastewater um, and other systems. And while looking at questions of liquid dynamics, um, obviously, we were very interested in always asking, you know, uh, whose perspective are we looking at here? Uh, who is framing the debate? Whose system counts? So issues concerning reflexivity. Um, is it going to promote uh, social justice or gender justice, you know, in that sense, the certain? And finally, um, wider properties around sustainability that Ian spoke about, uh, the resilience, the durability, the ability to withstand shocks over time, but more critically, for whom? I mean, who are we interested in? Whose interests are being advanced here? So if I give you a couple of examples now, largely from India, I, um, in terms of different aspects of my work and also a step center work, and I can give you other examples from other contexts too. Um, if we look at dam-based development um, globally, uh, this was part of the supply-driven paradigm. In the 50s, 60s, the large dam was really seen as the solution to part of the national sort of project, the modernization project in countries across Asia and Africa. Um, it was really seen as a solution to achieve food security, water security, etc. And it was really a very top-down uh, command and control type of water management. Um, it was seen as essential and people who were displaced or people who had to give way for the construction of dams were seen as making a sacrifice in the interest of the nation. There was this wider idea of public purpose, which has increasingly been contested. And even though uh, large dams entailed a huge exercise of power in terms of their execution, there was always this dominant narrative of Tina, there is no alternative. We actually have to dam these rivers, we have to do this, because that's the only way we can bring water to the dry areas, we can achieve um, energy security, food security, etc. But of course, there are very, very contested debates around sustainability in dams. And you know, it's a classic example of really diverse understandings of what constitutes sustainability and sustainable development when you're talking about actually transforming a free-flowing river into a series of reservoirs, into dams, um, which might uh, lead to destruction of, of river valleys, of uh, fishing systems, of the forest, of displaced people. But on that, by contrast, you are actually uh, delivering water to millions of people, you're delivering electricity to millions of people, um, etc. 
uh, often the question is asked, okay, but who are these millions? You know, who's actually benefiting and what is the political economy? And then there are these questions of uncertainty. So it's very clear that uh, dams transform river systems. Um, there, there are all the issues about what they do to the river and also questions around their wider resilience in, um, around, you know, especially when we're talking about climate change. Uh, dams have recently seen a resurgence globally, um, not least around nexus debates and around climate change debates because they're seen as a clean form of energy. Uh, but of course, the uncertainties that are embodied in them are also manifold and, and quite massive. Um, so in my work in Western India, I was looking at a massive dam under construction or several dams, and I was looking at the, the politics of scarcity in a dry land, um, which is uh, Kutch, and I uh, was very interested in trying to understand um, the diverse politics, the different understandings of scarcity, um, and how people actually in the dry land were living and coping with scarcity. Um, and to some extent, um, there were diverse narratives. So the dominant narrative was that um, you have these major water scarcities that are undermining economic development, and that's why uh, the large dam and its construction is really necessary, uh, and you know you need that for water delivery. And by contrast, there were critics and others who would say that, um, you know, don't look at scarcity. And indeed, a lot of my work highlighted that we really have to denaturalize what is seen as a sort of uh, physical and natural problem of scarcity. And um, in reality, these are human induced. They are often because of mismanagement, because of flawed policies. Um, and this was a narrative that often came out. Um, you know, there are different alternatives. People are maintaining their livelihoods amidst uncertainties. And you know, rather than these large dams, there are alternatives. You can draw on smaller options. You can do rainwater harvesting, et cetera, et cetera. And so a lot of the characteristics and issues that Ian spoke about in terms of stability, resilience, durability, robustness, you see that in the large dams debate, um, and indeed in questions of water management. Because if you're taking a short-term response, you could look at something in terms of the maintenance of stability of supply, and so the dam will achieve that. You know, um, Water supply engineers and managers do that in the short term, but then they also have to confront long-term secular shifts in rainfall and hydrological patterns. Um, by contrast, if you look at wider questions or different questions of resilience or robustness on the long term, uh, this looks at wider issues of droughts and floods, of how you manage climate change, um, and uh, wider techniques. So you could build on, for example, local understandings of resilience, how local people have been coping with uncertainty over time, different techniques and technologies, such as tank systems, water harvesting, etc. Um, and sort of, and finally, it could also mean um, sort of long-term changes in water supply and use through long-term shifts in land use, in agricultural practices, in crop types and varieties, um, et cetera. So in that sense, it really means rethinking how we look at uh, life in drylands more generally. So I'll just talk to you briefly about uh, the STEPS project now that we did uh, on peri-urban sustainability. Um, the future is largely urban, as you know, and the peri-urban is a very contested space. Um, a lot of people, it's this space that falls in between the urban and the rural, um, and it's, um, it's increasingly recognized, but also because it falls in, and this falls in, this, in, the, in the loops between jurisdiction and administrative sort of gaps, it's very difficult for people to take it seriously. So you often have people who don't want to take responsibility. A lot of people who live in peri-urban spaces are people who've been displaced from cities, who um, don't have rights, and so uh, they lack access to, to, to actual titles, to, to citizenship um, claims, and they, they do act, lack access to services. So this is a space that is characterized by degradation, marginalization, um, ambiguity, informality, and, and illegality. Um, obviously, there are very rich people who may live there and middle class people who choose to live there because life may be cheaper and they move out from the city. But the ones who are forced there, or who are there without much rights, really fall into this sort of continuum of informality and illegality. And we did, uh, together with JNU and other colleagues and Sarai uh, in Delhi, we did a case study in Ghaziabad where we, our entry was on water, but we also looked at cross-domain work. And we really found that the peri-urban was falling in between the cracks. So there was really a kind of organized irresponsibility in terms of water provision. 
And so in this uh, study, we identified the different actors and their positionality in relation to peri-urban water management. Uh, we looked at diverse narratives and aspirations. We looked at how poor people were mobilizing for their rights and services. Um, and also we looked at the politics of sustainability, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, the dominant narratives were very much that of quite unrealistic, actually, very unrealistic for the whole world, this universal safe access via piped water and supply. I mean, this dream has been realized in, many, in, you know, in most parts of the global north. It's a 18, you know, um, but in most parts of the world, it's still very, very difficult to realize, and especially in, uh, in, in informal settlements and in peri-urban areas, and indeed in some remote rural areas, too, around the world. Uh, the other dominant narrative is that of cost recovery and commodification. So you bring the market in to solve the problems. Uh, in reality, poor people pay um, up to 20% of their income on actually water around the world. In some parts of Ghana, in slums, this is really a realistic figure. And it's actually pretty shocking when you think about it. Um, and finally, there, the other narrative was about uh, how do you make the water safe, you know, questions of safety, especially because we're talking about a lot of pollution in this area. A lot of industries in this area have moved out from the city, and the water was really degraded. So uh, there was a huge local uh, filter industry, a bottled water industry, all over the place, where people were actually uh, paying a lot of money for clean water because the state just couldn't provide um, this clean water. And indeed, a lot of uh, water from um, irrigation also being used as wastewater. So sort of wastewater also being used in irrigation to grow vegetables, spinach. So people like in Delhi probably eat spinach from Ghaziabad. Um, so in some ways, this was an area with tremendous water injustices. Just in terms of who had access, a lot of people were illegal. Um, and you know they had to steal. They could only get water either through stealing water to getting dirty water from there or crossing a river, a river line, a very busy river line. And actually, many people would die when they would cross that river line because that the, was their only way to get water. So we're really talking about a very charged situation uh, through which people actually got access to something as basic as water. So I'm just going to show you a little clip now. मेरा नाम रतन देवी है। पानी तो बहुत चाहिए, भैंस भी है, गाय भी है, सोलह सदस्य भी हैं। हमारे यहाँ पानी की कोई सुविधा नहीं है। हमारे यहाँ सरकार पानी की कोई सुविधा नहीं दे रही। अब अपन आप तो करने हैं वो हमने नगर निगम की सप्लाई सप्लाई पे पाइप लगाया है। टंकी लगवा लिया पानी तो थोड़ी देते हैं रात को तीन बजे दें ढाई बजे दें दो बजे दें वो का टाइम थोड़ा ही है अब वो टंकी टाइम पे आ जाए और हमारी आंख खुल जाए तो हम भर लें अगर आंख ना खुली तो पानी गया पानी से तो आद पानी तो आदमी का जीवन नहीं उम्मीद हमें ये है सुन रहे हैं कि हाँ भाई सुन मुझे इस जमीन पर खेती करते हुए तीस साल हो गए मेरे पास पांच एकड़ जमीन है सब्जी उगाते हैं गेहूं उगाते हैं और धान उगाते हैं खेती के काम के लिए ना तो कोई मतलब कनेक्शन दिया किसानों को और ना कोई सरकारी ट्यूबवेल लगा जो पानी की सुविधा करी है गांव वालों ने वो अपने तरीके से करिए ये गांव से गांव के अंदर नाली बनी हुई है उनसे जाके नीचे में जहां पे पानी निकलता खेत में और वहां पे कच्ची नालियां बनाकर खेतों में पहुंचाया जाता है ये तो जिस फसल को देना देते हैं वो सेहत के लिए नुकसान देती है शरीर के लिए हानिकारक है उन्हें तो जहां पे प्रदर्शन होते हैं ये होते हैं मार धाड़ होती है उनके लिए ये पानी का इंतजाम कर रहे हैं गांव से कोई मतलब नहीं है गांव में तो सीधे साधे लोग रहते हैं
मैं एक पत्रकार हूँ मैं प्रदूषण पर भी कुछ काम करता हूँ और ज़मीन से रिलेटेड जो भूमि अधिग्रहण के संबंध में जो विषय हैं उन पर भी मैं अपना काम करता हूँ गाजियाबाद जनपद देश का तीसरा प्रदूषित शहर है और ये क्रिटिकल जोन घोषित किया गया है नहीं हैंड पंप का जो जींस जो जो इंडस्ट्री जो कंटेमिनेशन कर रही है ना और इसके पोल्यूशन बोर्ड वाले लेके गए हैं तो वो रिपोर्ट दिए उसे बड़ा साफ है मैंने कहा तुम बेवकूफ ये एकदम काला निकल रहा है ये रिपोर्ट उसी की है तो खान बोला नहीं नहीं उस मैंने कहा मैं और अलग कराएंगे हम पूरा वो कर देंगे ना खत्म ही कर देगा आदमी को लेकिन इसके अलावा एक और बड़ी समस्या ये है कि यहाँ गाजियाबाद में बहुत पोल्यूटिंग इंडस्ट्रीज मिनिस्टर्स की हैं मैं अगर किसी कंपनी की कंप्लेन करता हूं और वो मिनिस्टर की है या किसी बड़े उद्योगपति की है जिसके संबंध बड़े बड़े मिनिस्टर से हैं तो मैं आई राइट टू इन्फॉर्मेशन के तहत अपलिक उसके एक्शन टेकन रिपोर्ट लेने के लिए कम आरटीआई फाइल करता हूं अगर उस पर भी नहीं होता है तो फिर हम लोग मैं पी आई आई कैन फाइल पी आई में सुप्रीम कोर्ट हाई कोर्ट में उसके खिलाफ एक जनहित याचिका दायर करने के लिए कदम उठा मेरा सपना है कि अगर ऐसा इस प्रयास से ये हो जाए तो ये राजधानी के नज़दीक सटा हुआ जो ज़िला है वो प्रदूषण रहित करने का मेरा सपना है actually found it quite challenging to look at sustainability um in this space because it was a very charged space it was a space that people didn't recognize as a space basically it was a transitory space um and it was an unrecognized space so in that sense it was very difficult to think about uh, what sustainability would would mean here um so of course there would be there were conceptions of it but it was still very difficult to think about the alternatives because um a lot of the alternative pathways or alternatives that we unpacked were could often fall in the category of coping you saw you know people getting by people just kind of getting by and surviving rather than actually coming up with some very strong um you know strong alternatives we also talked about very strong uh, questions around political economy you know the industry is getting away uh, people who really completely disenfranchised who don't count um and in some ways because they were surviving and because of the resilience of local people to survive despite all the problems you in some ways the uh, powerful actors were kind of being let off the hook because you know people do have to survive one way or the other and they have to get their water from somewhere um and so we actually found that there was a slight danger of over romanticizing uh, local resilience in this context because you know you're talking about a situation that is very intractable so i'll i'll end there